The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. I don't think in any Mass we've done, uh, we've had any Gospel that didn't fit perfectly for the lesson. Because today, uh, we're going to discuss the Holy Spirit in the Church. And I will be bringing up the Blessed Mother. And of course, uh, we hear in the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, we're going to try to uh, reflect a little bit on on who he is, and what the church is, and what Mary is, who Mary is, and what it means for us, if we can kind of put it all together. Remember in the Trinity, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. We say, I don't want to go into a whole review of the Trinity lesson, right? But you might remember we talked about the Holy Spirit as the love of the Father and the Son. Like when we said, proceeds from the Father and the Son. The love of the Father and the Son uh, spirates, you know, generates the Holy Spirit. And, um, but we have to remember that the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father are all co-equal. The Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, I like to think of as God in us. Right? God in our hearts, the, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts. <clears throat> and that's kind of how we speak of the Holy Spirit as the effects that the Holy Spirit has in us. We, we call the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the giver of life that we're speaking about is spiritual life, eternal life. God in us, making us holy. Sanctifying us is the word. So that's kind of, you know, when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think of, um, you know, the Holy Spirit acting, you know, invisible, um, kind of hard to picture, really kind of only pictured through the symbols of the Holy Spirit or the words of the gospel, but active in the world, like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know, you can see the wind in a field, you know, like you can see the effect of the wind, like in a wheat field, picture way, way out west somewhere big wheat field, and the wind, I don't know if you've ever seen this before in TV or, or live, where the wind seems to be rushing around all in these grains of wheat. Um, it's a beautiful image of heaven, to be quite honest, because uh, St. Paul talks about us being like grains of wheat that come into a stalk. You know, so think of a wheat field and the wind, you can see it whipping around. That's, you see the effect of the Holy Spirit, even though you can't see the Holy Spirit. I do want to read another revelation of the Holy Spirit, and this actually has to do with your confirmation, because you'll know when you get confirmed, 
uh, we use the symbol of Pentecost at your confirmation. We wear red, and I'll show you why. So this comes from the Acts of the Apostles, right? So what happens? Jesus is crucified, rises from the dead, he ascends into heaven. And when he ascends into heaven, he says, go to Jerusalem, back to the upper room for the Last Supper, where he had the Last Supper, and wait for the coming of the Spirit. And the Bible tells us that Mary was there. Very often you'll see pictures of Pentecost where Mary is in the middle, right? Because she's the most greatest human being ever made, right? She's in the middle, and um, you see all the apostles around her, and, and you'll see like with fire over every one of their heads, right? That's, a, that's a, You'll see that when you start for confirmation, okay? So here's from the Acts of the Apostles. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, this is 10 days after Jesus' ascension, they were all in one place together. That means the apostles and the Blessed Mother and all the other people. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So the apostles were all speaking different languages, but every person heard them saying it in their own language. And so they were astounded and amazed, and they asked, are not these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how does each of us hear them in his native language? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty acts of God. That is considered the birthday of the church. So, using that as a revelation of the Holy Spirit, what did we see at the birth of the church and what did we see in the outpouring, right? We see the outpouring of the Spirit. And what is this Feast of Pentecost? We call it Pentecost because we think of it, uh, the feast we have, you know, um, it's 50 days after Easter, Pentecost. What was it in ancient Jerusalem? Why were there so many Jews from all over the world there? It was one of the three great feasts that Jews had to go to Jerusalem for. And this one in particular, I guess, gathered people from all over the Roman Empire, all over the world, would walk to Jerusalem. That's why they all speak different languages, but they're all Jewish. Many of them are converts to Judaism. And what's the big deal on this? Okay, Pentecost was the feast where they celebrated the giving of the law of God. They were celebrating, if you will, Exodus, the freedom from slavery, and the giving of the law of God, okay? What are we celebrating when we think of the Holy Spirit being poured into our hearts? That the law of God is written in our hearts. So what did God do? He used this holy day to be the birth of the church because the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, the Blessed Mother, or it was already upon the Blessed Mother, as you heard in the, uh, in the, the other gospel, right? The gospel of Luke, of the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. I'll get to that in a minute. But they, they received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in different languages. That's why it's called the Baptist birth of the church. Because why? Because um, they could speak in every tongue and every language and every land. And they could proclaim the gospel to every land. That's the idea. That's, that's what, the, what it's telling us. Um, so what is, when you think of the Holy Spirit, we think of this, we think of the creed. Right? The Holy Spirit is sent by the Son, but sent by the Father and the Son to make us holy, to make us the people of God. And we become members of the people of God through baptism. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to proclaim the gospel, to witness it in our life, and even go out into the world as the apostles do, and spread the gospel. This is what your confirmation is about, by the way. This is why confirmation is so important. It's also why, and I'll talk about later, why 
you know, confirmation. You have to have confirmation to do other things in the church because of your vocation. Whatever your vocation is going to be, you've got to have that. You've got to be confirmed. You have to be an adult in the church. And the Holy Spirit is sent to us to walk through history with us. As the Lord says, to lead us into all truth. All the books of the Bible are written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how we know they're true. When we're thinking about doctrine, when we're thinking about, well, what do we believe about this and that? It's not in the Bible. What do we believe? Right? And, we have, and people have to come together and think about it. We know the Holy Spirit is there to guide us into all truth. And as Saint, as our, our Saint, as Jesus tells us, as our Lord tells us, the Holy Spirit is sent to us to comfort us, to encourage us, to, uh, to help lead us through history, which is a very difficult time. So that's the Holy Spirit, but also you can see I'm talking a little bit about the church, right? Because what happens? Now, in the Holy Spirit, we as the people of God are made into the church. That's what the church is called. And um, it's not that the church is in addition to Jesus Christ or to the Holy Spirit and their missions, but the church, us, the people of God, are, if you will, the means, the sacrament. We're the, we're the vehicle of the Holy Spirit. We're incorporated. And so this is why you get into um, the names for the church. So where does the church come from? Does anybody know the answer? Who founded the church? Just yell it out if you know. Was it St. Peter who founded the church? Was it some middle, pope of the Middle Ages? Who founded the church? This is very interesting. That I know you're know, probably all afraid to answer anyway, but... It's very interesting that we don't automatically know the answer because we think it's impossible. This can't be the case. Jesus Christ founded the church. Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church. All right? Right? When St. Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he says, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And all through the New Testament, they use the word church. And back then, it was just one church. It's been broken up a lot. You know what I mean? But there is one church, and I'll get into it. But, but Christ founded a church. So it's not like this thing that somebody invented. Christ founded it, and it becomes, the, and the Holy Spirit makes the church, if you will. Okay? Why? Why does the church exist? What I was basically saying, right? Uh, Christ had to come to free us from our sins, and the church becomes the vehicle by which we are given the Holy Spirit to be made holy. So, what are kind of the. Um, when you think of the names of the church, right? So we hear the name people of God, right? The first thing that makes the church is people, us, right? People of God. Why? Because it goes back to that ancient Jewish uh, uh, example that the Jews were the people of God and they were freed from slavery in Egypt and they were given the law right, from the Ten Commandments and in the spirit, we are the people of God, we are freed from slavery to sin and we're given the law of the gospel. You might hear the church called the body of Christ. Why? Because our baptism unites us to Christ, unites us to one another, and we become, if you will, one body, right? Um, in fact, you know, if you say, you know, when we think of the church, we think of it as um, the body of Christ, and we like to say, it's a phrase, the Holy Spirit is like the soul of the church. Right? If we're all united in one body and Christ is the head of the church and we're its members, then the Holy Spirit is, the, is like the, the soul of the church. And the church also is called the bride of Christ. Because we say we're the members of the body of Christ, but there's also a distinction between us and Christ. And what's the distinction God is giving us? Right? A marital symbol. Right? Christ is the bridegroom and we are the we are the bride. We, God is bringing us all into what? The wedding feast of heaven. So these are some of the images of the church. So in this creed, right, you may have heard, uh, it says, I believe in one holy cat, one, it's commas after every one of these, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Okay? Here's the one thing you can memorize for today. Those are called the four marks of the church. Right? I'm, I actually didn't know this for, until I was like really an adult. So it's actually easy. To, when someone says, what's the four marks of the church? You're like, I don't even know what that means. Right? What are the four marks? What are the four 
attributes. What is the church known as, right? Church is known as one, holy, Catholic, and that's actually a lowercase c, but for us it's a capital C because, you know, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So, what does it mean to be one? What does it mean for the church to be one? Well, it means we're unified. We're unified in our profession of faith, right? We're unified like a body, as we were talking about, with St. Peter is the first pope, and so we have a, a unity of government, you know, like there's a unification of the church. We are, everybody, every Catholic in the world, doesn't matter if you're in China or in America, everybody knows who the pope is, right? So that's a certain unity to the church, right? And we're unified in our sacraments. You can even say we're unified in the love of God. Holy, right? Speaking of the love of God, what does holy mean? Right? Well, these sacraments bring us sanctifying grace, and the holiness of the church is meant is to say that the teaching is holy, the Holy Spirit is holy, what Christ did for us and dying for us is holy. Now, does that mean, here's a question because I see all kind of, does every, is every living human being in the church holy? We say the church is holy. Are we talking about every individual? No, of course not. Is every priest holy? Is every nun holy? Is every pope holy? Every bishop holy? Yeah. Definitely not. Right? Unfortunately. Right? So we are all sinners. But the church in herself, if you will, as a bride, as something Jesus died for, as something that conveys the love of God, the church herself as a, as a body, as a people, is holy because of the Holy Spirit. Um, and who shows us that this holiness is possible? Sorry. Saints. Right? So you say, well, that's not possible. Everybody can't be holy. Nobody can be holy. All this kind of stuff. There's no such thing as holiness. That's why we extol the saints. The saints are members of the church. People in heaven are members of the church. People on earth are members of the church. People in purgatory, being purified, are members of the church. That's what the church is. It's all the people that you know are, are live in the Holy Spirit because of sacraments. Catholic. What does Catholic mean? It's actually there's actually a very translation for the word Catholic. It's called universal. Universal. It means like that whole thing we saw in the gospel that the church is all over the world. Catholic Church is everywhere, okay? And because it's given as an instrument to send, to, to let people know who God is all over the world. And then lastly, apostolic. Again, I was going to talk about the St. Peter, but apostolic, right? We have 12 apostles. We heard them here. They had the, 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 you know, they were sent out by Christ, right? But also, when we say it's an apostolic church, we say our teaching comes down from the apostles. Right? We look at what's in the Bible, the writings in the Bible. The teachings come from Jesus. They're trans transmitted to us through the apostles. Jesus didn't write anything in the book, in the Bible. It was all the apostles who wrote this, other people who wrote these letters. Okay, so it's transmitted to us both in word and in tradition. Believe it or not, baptizing and how we baptize and how we do the sacraments goes all the way back in some form to the apostles. That's how we know. Um, we know that the apostles, you know, when you get baptized, it's like, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, right? And I have to pour the water over the baby's head three times. Or you may see people be dunked three times. Now, when Jesus says, go forth and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what he says in the Bible, he doesn't say, he doesn't give an instruction book, okay, now, pour water over the baby's head three times, Right? But we know from ancient documents that's what they were doing. They were dunking people and all this. Well, who taught them to do that? The apostles taught them that. Who taught the apostles? Jesus. So that's why we say we're in an apostolic church. And the other aspect that makes us apostolic is bishops, right? I'm like a I'm like a worker bee, right? I'm a pastor here, I'm a priest. But bishops, we say, are the successors of the apostles. Right? So when the apostles, like St. Paul talks about this all the time. You ever heard the letter to Timothy? It's a letter from St. Paul. So St. Paul's an apostle. He's writing to somebody named Timothy, who is fairly young. And he makes Timothy what? A bishop somewhere. So nobody knows this, but this stuff that we're doing, it didn't look like this. Right? But it was the same thing. They said mass, they preached the word, they proclaimed the gospel, they baptized babies. 
right? Somebody had to teach people, teach a little, teach, uh, teach people lessons and teach the teenagers and adults and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we call it apostolic. Um, so that's basically uh, the, you know, the Holy Spirit and the, and the church. Um, I want to bring out a, a topic again, which is um, all these things have marital meaning. The relationship of God, the relationship of Christ to his church has marital meaning, okay? Because God loves us. So when you, this is very important. How we're made reflects God, okay? God made us in his image. And so when we think of a family, we start thinking about, and God is saying, I'm going to, I am the bridegroom, and you are the bride, right? He's saying that, you know, heaven is a family. Heaven is like a wedding feast. God is going to marry humanity. And here's what's amazing about this. This brings us to the Blessed Mother, right? Because the Blessed Mother is what we would call the icon of the church. If you could point to one person who sums up the church in herself, it's the Blessed Mother. In fact, there was only one person in the church at one point when, with this gospel where God, you know, and, and the language is marital, like the Holy Spirit will descend upon you and overshadow you, right? That's like the Holy Spirit, obviously, it, that's how Jesus was conceived, right? So that's like a marital language. So she becomes, if you will, the mother of God. She's also the icon of the church because if the church is the bride of Christ, Mary is the first one. So... We have to realize that um, when we think of Mary, so we have devotions to saints. People have devotions. Like this parish, it, uh, the patron saint of this parish is St. Lucy. But everybody, everybody is devoted to the Blessed Mother. So Mary is so special because she carried God, when we think of Christmas, because she's the icon of the church, uh, because she becomes our mother from the cross, Jesus gives her to us as the beloved disciples, as our mother. That's why the rosary is not just another devotion. There's all kinds of ways you can pray. There's all kinds of, kinds of devotions out there that people do. But the rosary is not just another devotion. The rosary, in a certain sense, is the ultimate devotion. It's, it's part and parcel of how we understand how God communicated to us because God was communicated to us through the Virgin Mary. When you think of what that symbolism is, is if this reading about the, if this reading about the Holy Spirit coming down at Pentecost gives us meaning or reveals God to us, the fact that God came to us through the Blessed Virgin Mary reveals God's action to us, what he does. That's why she's very special. And what does we see her today do in the gospel? She says yes to God. She says yes to her vocation to the Lord. She was only a teenager. She's probably the same age as you guys. When it happened, right? So, uh, very special person. And she was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. If Jesus died at 33, she probably wasn't even 50 years old and watched her son die on the cross, right? But she was the ultimate disciple. She always went and said yes to God, whatever it was for her life. Which brings us to what? Confirmation. Baptism is to make us holy. Baptism is to, to have the Holy Spirit dwell within us. Confirmation, modeled after Pentecost, makes us, if you will, um, holiness for the world. So you have, this is why if you're going to be confirmed, this is very important. I know right now you might be like, oh please, I can't stand it. But, you know, if you want to be a godparent, you got to be confirmed. If you want to get married to the church, you're supposed to be confirmed. I certainly can't be a priest without being confirmed. So there's no reason why you should be able to be met. You know, that, that's, I mean, technically you can get away with it, but you need, a, you need a pass, you need a dispensation, right? But the point being that you're supposed to be confirmed is when you become an adult in the church. You become, uh, your holiness isn't just for you, it's for, it's for the world, it's for your vocation, it's to say yes to God. And so, um, you know, the goal here is to understand who we are in the church, in the spirit, and what, you know, really when we think about it, today in our prayers, let's, uh, let's remember to pray that God shows us our vocation and that we, like the Blessed Mother, because of the Holy Spirit moving through us, will say yes to God and whatever he asks us to do.